Well, when I was in high school, uh, I read uh, for the first time Virgil's Aeneid. Uh, probably many high school Latin students will commiserate with me that it was a um, very difficult experience to get through this extremely complicated Latin poem. But the Aeneid, of course, is one of the really masterpieces of the Western tradition. It's echoed by one of my heroes, Dante. Uh, the author of the Aeneid is Virgil, and of course, Virgil becomes the mystic guide to uh, Dante and the Divine Comedy. But the Aeneid tells the story of Aeneas. Who was Aeneas? Well, he was a Trojan at the time of the Trojan War with Greece, and he manages to escape from the flames of, um, of dying Troy. Aeneas is also the son of a goddess. His father was Anchises, who was a mortal, but his mother was the goddess Venus. So he's a semi-divine figure. Aeneas escapes from Troy on Virgil's telling, makes his way around the Mediterranean. He comes to uh, Carthage, has adventures there, and eventually makes his way to Latium, which is the area around Rome, hence the Latin language. And Aeneas there becomes the founding father, really, of the whole Roman political establishment. So Virgil's telling this great uh, myth of origins, if you want. Where does Rome's power, authority, dignity, piety come from? Aeneas, by the way, is always called Pius Aeneas, the pious Aeneas. He sums up, you want, the best of the Roman uh, virtue. Where does it come from? It comes from this noble race of the Trojans. So, Aeneas gives rise uh, to Rome and really gives rise to the line that has culminated with Caesar Augustus. Now, Virgil is a contemporary of Caesar Augustus. He writes the uh, Aeneid at, at that period, and he reads several sections of it to Augustus. It's seen by many people as sort of the great uh, founding myth of, uh, of Rome. Now, Caesar Augustus was also semi-divine. He was also the son of a god. How come? Well, he was the nephew and then adopted son of Julius Caesar, who was uh, assassinated in 44 BC by Brutus and Cassius and their co-conspirators. Um, he survives this um, period, he, Augustus, and he allies himself with Mark Antony. They eventually uh, do battle with Cassius and Brutus, and they emerge as victorious. Then, of course, Augustus falls into um, disharmony with uh, Antony, and they have this great climactic battle, the Battle of Actium in 31 BC, at which point Augustus emerges as the great undisputed champion of the world. He's the leader of the world politically. And Virgil is telling the story of how this great Augustan divine line, so Aeneas, the son of a goddess, and now Augustus, the son of a god, the son of Julius Caesar, how they emerged and um, uh, reigned in great power. What you see in the Aeneid is a singing of the glory of Rome and of Roman virtue. How did Rome maintain its power? Well, through military conquest, through courage, through violence, just you know, to be blunt about it. And Augustus now is the one who sums up the best of um, the glorious Roman heritage. Now, here's what I want you to see. Christmas time. Sentimental time, sure, it's a good family time and all that's great. Christmas stories in the Gospels, beautiful tales we tell our kids, yeah, sure, charming. But if that's all we see, we're going to miss a lot of the power of these stories. Look now at the famous Christmas account in Luke's Gospel. We read it at Midnight Mass. It's probably the most famous of the Christmas stories. Luke begins in a consciously subversive way because he mentions by name Caesar Augustus. When Caesar was the emperor of the world and when his flunky Quirinius was the governor of Syria, so he begins by invoking these great Roman authoritative figures. And more to it, when Augustus is doing something that is preeminently powerful, a typically Roman move, to take a census of the whole world. Now, you see, at that moment, if we stop the story right there, you'd say, yeah, there's, that's Virgil would like that. Virgil would love that story. Here's Caesar Augustus at the height of his powers, reigning as the emperor of the world and commanding a census. Great, there is the golden age of Caesar Augustus. 
But then what Luke does, of course, is he undermines that myth with a new narrative. The narrative of a new king. Who is he? Well, he's not born of, of the royal line going back to Troy. He's born of a royal line going back to David. So he's called the son of David. Who is David? Not a Trojan king, but this Israelite king. More to it, he comes into the world not in a palace, but in a barn or a, or a cave or something, some out-of-the-way place. In where? Bethlehem of Judea? Where's that? It's not one of the capitals of the world, a little dusty outpost of the empire. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's not a rangy, powerful figure. He's wrapped up. He's visited by shepherds. Well, who were shepherds? But they were kind of like street people today, like, like bums, you know? That's his court, shepherds. He's in a, in a barn, wrapped in swaddling clothes. What's happening is Luke is undermining the great sort of Virgilian narrative, the great Roman narrative of power and pomp and military force. The true king, the son of David, is born in humility and poverty and simplicity and nonviolence. To me, the climax of Luke's story is the arrival of the angels. These powerful figures, but not in the worldly sense. They're powerful in the heavenly sense. And the word that Luke uses when he says a whole host of angels, a choir of angels emerges. The word in Greek, stratias, means army. An army of angels arrive and they announce the new king. Well, see, Caesar Augustus, like um, Aeneas, like all great worldly powers, is backed up by military force, backed up by the club and the sword and the spear, and now we'd say the, the gun and the bomb and the plane. So it always goes. That's the master narrative of all worldly powers. I mean, I'm not just blaming uh, poor Augustus. There's the story behind Napoleon, the story behind um, Charlemagne, the story behind any worldly figure. And then there's Luke's story about this baby king, the son of David, born in poverty, simplicity, humility, and who has, though, with him an army that's more powerful than the army of Caesar Augustus. And this king, and that's the story of the Gospels, story of the Gospels, story of the Pauline epistles, that this baby king, come of age as the crucified and risen Lord, will indeed become the king of the world. It's not Caesar Augustus who will reign and his descendants. It'll be Christ. Now, to bring this thing together up to the present day, so it's not just all oh, these old battling narratives from 2,000 years ago, where's Caesar Augustus today? Well, he's a distant memory. His descendants, where are they? Long gone. I guess there are some running around, but who are they? No one knows. Where's Roman power, Roman Empire? Long disappeared. Where do all the empires of the world go? Eventually on the dustbin of history. But the successor of Peter, who was Jesus' uh, friend and disciple, is over in Rome right now. You can go visit him. The church, which is the embodiment of Christ's empire, is still alive and well, and it flourishes all over the world. This is a battle of narratives, if you want. The Aeneid versus Luke's story of the coming of the true emperor. And the, the prevailing of that latter narrative over the former is a matter of empirical verification that we can look around the world today and see the endurance of the great empire of Christ. That is the properly subversive story of Christmas. Mm -hmm.